We all have issues. And sometimes we cause those struggles. And the struggles that we cause, we can see coming. And, and we can say, you know, I, I have to own that one. That, you know, if I wouldn't have done what I've done, I wouldn't be in this struggle. But today we're going to talk about maybe some struggles that we don't see coming. Struggles that is really not my fault. I have somebody that just passed away, or I lost my job, or maybe somebody's going through a divorce. And instantaneously, you get the phone call, and all of a sudden, that shock hits in. You've been in shock before, right? You, nothing moves. Nobody cares. You feel like life is all by yourself, and there's nothing anybody could do to get you out of the pit that you are in. Sometimes those struggles, sometimes those struggles are so overwhelming within our life, we have no idea how to handle life when we are in that struggle, when we get that phone call, when we are so down, so depressed, so out of it, that we have no idea what to do. Most influential events start with a struggle. You can't go around it, over it, you can't do anything except for dive right into it. Getting through what you're going through is a struggle. These are influential events in your life, and sometimes you don't see them coming, but you know that when you go through them, it's going to radically change everything about you. You will never be the same after you go through this event. Whatever the event is, whatever you've gone through, that event is going to change your direction of life. There's all kinds of stories in the Bible about, about what people went through and, and how they were like in shock when they were going through it. But in Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 12, it says, For man also does not know his time, like fish taken in a cruel net, like birds caught in a snare. So the son of men are snared in evil time when it falls suddenly upon them. When it falls upon you. When all of a sudden life stinks. People go into shock or they go into a struggle. In Jeremiah chapter 50 verse 30 it says, An astonishing and horrible thing has been committed into the land. Ezekiel chapter 3 verse 15, And I saw where they sat, and they remained there astonished among them for seven days. Isaiah says this, Therefore my loins are filled with pain. Pain hath taken hold of me, like the pain of a woman having labor. I was distressed when I heard it. I was dismayed when I saw it. My heart wavered. Fearlessness frightened me. The night for which I longed, he turned into fear for me. When you are in shock and the struggle that you're going through is overwhelming, astonishing, fearful, what do we do? How do we do it? You know, there's things that we have to do when we're in these struggles. But I want to take two aspects of the struggle. I want to take the aspect of, of what do we do when there are people around us that are struggling. You know, because, you know, we, we on the outside, sometimes we can see the struggles, and, and we really sometimes don't know what to say, and we really don't know what to do. So sometimes we just stick our head in the sand and say, you know what, I hope everything's going to be okay. And then I want to talk to you about the ones that are going through the struggle. Because you're going to be one of these three people. You know someone who is in a crisis right now. And the crisis right now is overwhelming for them. It is something that they have no desire to go through, but it's something that is, pains them to wake up in the morning. It pains them to go to sleep at night. It is the most devastating thing that they've ever gone through, and they just wish it would end. But they don't want to say anything. They don't want to look like they're weak. But you know some people. You know some people that are going through a struggle right now that's overwhelming to them. Or you may be in a crisis right now. You may know somebody, but then if we were honest with each other, which we usually aren't in church, we usually just put a smile on our face and hey, everything's great, but 
if we were real, like we were supposed to be, you would say, man, I've got this struggle going on in my life. I've got this thing going on in my life that I really don't know what to do, and it is eating me up, and I just don't have an answer. Or you may not realize it, but you're about to go through one. You know somebody, or you're in one, or you're about to go through one. It may be all kinds of different things. It may be a financial struggle. Give me an amen. Anybody have a financial struggle? No, yeah. Give me an amen. All right. Here's a hard one. What about a health struggle? What about a health struggle? I've kind of documented my mom's issues that she's going through, but she's at an assisted living home now. She, uh, she fell down. She couldn't take care of herself, and now she's in this assisted living. So I got a phone call from my sister yesterday, and, and in the middle of the night, she tried to get up and walk, and she couldn't walk, and she fell down and hit her head against the sink, and her whole side of her face is black and blue. And is, You look at that, and you see this 87-year-old lady, and the, the, not the person that she used to be by any means, and it kind of hurts to see it, and it kind of wants you to walk beside her. And, and I went with her, and I talked to her, and I just tried to minister to her. But she's in a struggle. She is in a health struggle. I wish I could lay my hands on her and pray over her and, and, and move her back 25 years and let her be five, 50 years old and do this thing over again. But life stinks sometimes. And she is in a health struggle. We have people that are in health struggles. that have heart attacks that are struggling their health. They wake up and they get this phone call from the doctor and the, the information they get is not good. Where do they go? What do we do? Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe somebody's struggling in relationships with your kids or with your spouse or with your parents. Or what if somebody that's close to you dies? Boy, those are some struggles. What do you do? I tell you what many of us do. Many of us are scared to go into the struggle. So we watch from a distance because we really don't know what to do. So we watch from a distance and we see this person that's struggling and they continue to go down this roller coaster ride of life in a depressed mode and they're crying for someone to get on this roller coaster with them, just to love them, just to help them. So I want to give you some practical points. How do you help a friend who's struggling? Galatians chapter 6, verse 2. It says, Bear another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. The law of Christ means love your neighbor as yourself. How do you go through somebody's struggle? You, you love them, and you, you, you help them, and, and how do you get into their life and help their struggle? But let me tell you something. You can't get into somebody's struggle while they're having a struggle, unless you're in the life before the struggle happens. They're not going to say, I'm having a struggle, and this guy that I don't know, can you come over here and get me out of my struggle? No, they only go to those that have been into their life, that have shared with them, that have ministered to them. That is the people. So we have to build those relationships way before struggles come, knowing the struggles will be there, but we must have those intimate people. So what do you do for a friend who's struggling? Very simple. This is going to change everything that you do. Show up and shut up. Say that with me. Show up and shut up. Some of the best advice a pastor can give you is to show up and don't say stupid stuff. Give me an amen. amen. Have you ever lost somebody or going through a major issue and somebody, they're trying, oh, you'll feel better next year. Uh, I'm living today. I don't care about next year. God had a plan. Well, I don't care about God's plan right now. Sometimes the deeper the tragedy, the less words that are needed. All you do is show up, let them know that you care, and cry. Let them know that you are, are willing to do whatever. Just show up and shut up. Job chapter 2 verse 11. Job has some friends here 
And he says this, Now when Job's three friends heard of all of his adversity that they had come upon him, each one came from his own place, for they had all made appointment together to come and mourn with him and to comfort him. In deep pain, you don't need words. You need a touch. You just need somebody to know that somebody loves you. <laughs> I know how you feel. No, you don't. I may have been able to go through maybe a sim similar thing, but I may have lost my dad, or I may have lost my son, or I may have lost my wife, but it's not the same. My pain is different than your pain. So to say, I know how you feel, no. I don't know if you do. I have sympathy for your pain. I want to walk with you. No one feels the loss of the same. Everybody's loss is the same in certain ways, but everybody responds to it differently. Everybody says this one. How are you holding up? The answer, oh, we're doing fine. The real answer, we're not. This stinks. The real answer is, I'm not doing really well. In a crisis moment, our life can fall apart in a second. When we show up in that moment, just be a friend. You know, in my job, I, I walk into those chaotic moments a lot. Walk into deaths a lot. I get some fun things. I get, I get the babies. I get to hold the new baby, and that's great. And, but I also have to maybe tell the mom that the baby's not doing too well either. I go over with somebody that just got diagnosed with cancer that has three months to live to six months to live, and I get to pray with them and love them. So in those chaotic, in those struggling moments where they have no control, they don't want the preacher to give them the sermon. They want the preacher to love them, to pray with them, and to hold their hand. But I believe sometimes when we go to God and we just ask God to bless them, to take care of them, to give them the wisdom, not to give them the answers all of a sudden, but it's okay, it's okay, because we don't have all of their answers. So the first one, say it back with me. Show up and... <laughs> yeah, I just want to tell you, shut up in church, but show up and shut up. Spend time with them, but don't give all the answers. The second thing is share their pain. Share their pain. Job chapter 2, verses 12 and 13, it says, And when they raised their eyes from afar, they did not recognize him. They lifted their voices and wept. And each one of them in their robes and sprinkled their dust and their heads towards heaven. So they sat down with him on the ground seven days and seven nights, and no one spoke a word to him. For they saw that his grief was very great. When they saw him from afar, they started to cry. They weren't going through the pain. They didn't have the emotional attachment to the pain. But somebody they loved was going through the struggle. It's called empathy. Because I know that you're struggling and I love you. I want to share your pain. When you hurt, I hurt. When you cry, I cry. When you laugh, I laugh. That is a friend. Share their pain. Share what's going on. The greater the grief, the fewer the words. Practice listening instead of talking. It's called the ministry of presence. Just be who God wants you to be. The Bible even says weep with those who weep. God himself mourns with all of us. Reminds me today that God, his heart, cares for every one of our struggles. And he wants to give us some tools in order to do life with people. We need to share the pain. Share the hurt. And then, here's the good one. Take initiative. Take initiative. In Proverbs chapter 3, verse 27, do not withhold good from those who are, whom it is due, but when it is the power of your hand to do it. So here's what, you, here's what we need to do. Run an errand for them. Babysit for them. Make a meal for them. 
mow the lawn, take out the trash, whatever needs to be done, but don't do this. Call me if you need anything. How can I help you? When somebody's going through a struggle, when they're in shock, hey, call me if you need anything. Okay, I'll never call them. I, I, I'll even forget that you asked me that because I, my focus is not on you're there and what you want to do. My focus is the, the struggle that I'm in and the shock that I'm in. So instead of saying, hey, call me if you need anything, why don't we as family and brothers and sisters just do? Just do. Hey, call them up and say, hey, I'm, I'm at Walmart. Can I pick you up something to eat tonight? Hey, uh, hey I'm, I'm over at Costco. Do you need something? Take the initiative. Don't ask, because if you ask, they're going to say, no, I'm fine. I'm good. But when you run an errand or you babysit or you give them time alone or make a meal or mow their lawn, you're showing, showing love. Do say, hey, I can bring a dinner over. Would you like it on Monday or Tuesday? You don't say, would you like a dinner? No, I am bringing a dinner over. Don't stay. Drop it off. Don't say, hey, can I have a dinner? Can you tell me how you're feeling? No, the presence of ministry is, here you are, and there I go. When somebody is hurting, when somebody is hurting, love them. When somebody is hurting, spend time with them. But don't tell them everything's going to be okay. Don't try to fix the problem. That phone call they received, there's a time, there's a time where they're friends that show up, and you know who your friends are. And they say you can count your friends on one hand. That if you go through a major calamity, that there will be five of your friends that will not ask to come over, but they will come over. You may not even know who those five friends are right now. But if something takes place with you, they would be on the phone or they would be driving to your house. Those are the friends during a calamity that you wrap your arms around. There will be a lot of people that will see the calamity from a distance. There'll be a lot of people that will pray for you in that calamity. But there'll be people that come alongside and those people hold on to. Those people that you can share your heart and your life with. Those people that are like Job's friends that heard of his calamity and they left their house to be with him for seven days and didn't say a word because the pain was so great. They didn't have the answers. They just wanted to be with their friend. We need friends like that. We need people that in the midst of our struggle that we will love and we will help. Okay, what do we do? You're in that struggle now. I'm in that struggle. What do we do when it's me? Okay, what, do we, what if it's me? I'm the pastor of your church. What, what if I have this major struggle going on? <laughs> I, I'm preaching today, so I got to come up here and I'll put my little mask on and I'll smile, I'll shake your hand, everything's wonderful, and everything's great. And you know what? There's no difference between the pastor of the church and the member of the church. When you walk in the doors, 95% of the struggles are staying outside because we don't want anybody to know I'm hurting. We all want that mask on. We all want it. We all want everybody to think I've got it together. I'm going to tell you something. This is Glenville. Nobody's got it together, okay? We're... We we're all just dysfunctional church here. So I want to give you two things. Number one, cry out to God. You know, this thing that we're going on in Dallas, we just need to cry out to God. It's a struggle in their life. It's a struggle in their city. It's a struggle in our country. We can't fix it. Only God can fix it. In Psalm chapter 50, verse 15 Call upon me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver you, and you shall glorify me. What's that mean? Call upon me. That means, that means whenever, whatever's taking place, when I can't handle it, I can't handle it. I have to call out to God in the midst of my fear, in the midst of my struggles. Say, Lord, I need you. We can't be so arrogant in our spiritual life to say God doesn't care or God won't handle this. God says call. I don't care when. I don't care how. Call out to me. If you're mad, call out to me. 
If you're frustrated, get mad at me. I'm a big God. I created the world. If you don't understand, and I understand, my ways are not your ways. Your ways are not like my ways. And if you don't understand, call out to me with a humble heart when you're struggling, when you're mad, when you don't understand, when you don't agree. Call out to me. He says that. He wants that. Because out of those struggles and those adversities becomes intimacy. But until we go through the struggle of, of, of anger and fear and call out to God, we will never experience the presence and the peace of God. Lamentations, of course, chapter 2, verse 19. Arise, cry out in the night. At the beginning of the watches, pour out your heart like water before the face of the Lord. Lift your hands towards him for the life of your young children who faint from hunger and the head are very street. What he, in struggles, cry out to God. Cry out at night. Cry out during the day. Don't be ashamed because I believe God is the only person that's going to fix that struggle. Sometimes those struggles can't be fixed. <laughs> Being here for almost 20 years, you look around the audience and you see individuals, family members that I've had the privilege to hold their memorial service. And I go into their house the night before the funeral and I sit down with them and talk to them about the memorial service. The, can't, the pain is real. The struggle is real. But I can cry out to God, but I can't change the fact. What we can do is just love and minister and care. So the first thing we do is cry out to God. The second thing is you let others help you. You let others help you. I love Proverbs chapter 17, verse 17. I, I didn't realize the whole meaning of this verse for a long time, but I do now. A friend loves at all times, but a brother is born for adversity. And I always thought, that means my brother and I are going to fight all the time. He, he was born to fight me. But you know what? A brother, a true brother, a true brother in Christ is born for adversity means if he loves me, when I'm going through my stuff, a true brother is born to help me get through my stuff. And if you have a brother or a sister and they are so tight, a friend loves at all times. But we act like nothing has happened. But when a brother comes up to you and says, I've earned the right to love you. I've gone through stuff with you. I remember a time where I had a good brother. I just lost my physical brother. He was the best man in my wedding. And he was my friend. And um, he died. And uh, I went back to the church and I preached that very next Sunday. My life on the inside was chaotic. But I didn't want anybody on the outside to know it was chaotic. And I had a friend of mine who's a missionary now to Tanzania. His name is Mitch Calmes. He was my high school teacher at the time. And he, God doesn't teach him. He came up to me. He goes, he's a professional counselor at the time for Minworth Meyer. He has his doctorate in, in counseling and you know, how would a counselor be able to figure me out? I'm, I know more than he does. He walked up to me. He said, Bruce, it's okay to mourn. It's okay to be yourself. And it's stupid to do what you're doing, acting like nothing's wrong. Because it's obvious. It's obvious your life is falling apart. It's obvious your heart is heavy. Don't act like there's nothing wrong. 
That's the best advice he could ever give me. I was so worried of what people thought. I couldn't take care of myself. I would put on the facade and I'd play the game and I was failing at that game. That was the best advice he could give me. Another piece of advice. Don't make important decisions in the crisis. In the middle of your crisis, don't make those important decisions. That I'm going to quit my job. I'm going to move to another state. I'm going to buy a car or buy a new house. Don't make those decisions. You know, when it says a brother is born for adversity and a friend loves at all times, our natural reaction in adversity is to do nothing is to withdraw, is to go back to your man cave, turn out the lights, shut the doors, sometimes turn the TV on, sometimes leave it off. But the natural desire during a crisis is to withdraw. That's why a brother is born for adversity. A brother or a sister that's born to adversity when the lights are off and the man is in his man cave and a tragedy or a struggle is taking place, he will not allow the door to remain shut. He will show up and shut up, but he's going to be in there. And that's what needs to be done. A brother that is born for adversity will know his brother's hurting, his brother's struggling. And he'll wrap his arms around him, and he'll help him. If you go through a crisis, we're all going to go through a crisis. Those five friends that are brothers, that's born for adversity, that's when you need to start your coalition. You need to be their brothers. They need to be your brother. That's when we can help each other. I didn't see it coming. But there are, in the middle of our own catastrophe, we know that we didn't see it coming. But God did. We may not understand why, but God does. We are finite. He is infinite. What He can do for us we cannot do for ourselves. Grief saddens and it shocks us. And it shocks us to our core. Not only to our core, but that grief, that sadness that shocks us to the core is the same grief that stays within our hearts and for our lives for many years. Many of you have planted, planted many tears. You've cried over many things. You've been hurt over a lot of different things. Plant our tears of sorrow. But the greatest thing the Bible says, we can have a harvest of joy. If we can endure the struggle, if we understand that the struggle that I'm going through, that God is in control of, He desires us not to hurt us, but He desires to help us, to heal us, to grow us, to go through that struggle with people that will love us, to draw glory to God. And in the midst of that struggle, understand that God's in control. And then when that struggle is over, bring glory to Him. Sometimes it feels like you have to climb Mount Everest. You're at the bottom, the pit, and the struggle, the hurt, the pain, the shock. It's too much to bear. But there's always those little tiny seeds of hope that somebody comes alongside you. We need to pray that that bitterness and anger will not consume us. The doubts and the fears and the insecurities do not dominate us. We will become wounded. We will become hurt. But those scars that are in us will make us stronger when we give them to God. Now, immediate satisfaction never takes place. Those scars 
those wounds, those struggles are real. But so are the masks. The masks that you put on. The games that we play. I'm going to ask a simple question. I want you to be completely bold-faced honest with your reaction. Okay? Everybody do this. Take your mask off. Put it down. Seat beside you. Physically do it. If you're going through a struggle, you list it. Physical, relational, financial, crisis with death. If you are going through a struggle and you need a brother, you need somebody to love you, you need somebody to pray for you, with your mask off, will you please stand to your feet? Just stand to your feet. Dear Father, these men and women need you. They are honest with you. And out of their heart, they cry out to you. Their struggle is real. Their fear of tomorrow is real. I pray that you'll put your hand upon them. I pray that you will bless them. I pray that you will give them the very desires of their heart. You asked us to cry out to you, and so we are crying out to you. Put your hand upon them. Bless them. Help them. Encourage them to be a vessel that the ointment of grace will be used. The tears that they shed will be shouts of joy into the future. But Lord, you see their hearts. Love them. Help them. Encourage them. And we pray for them.